The Adventure of Black Peter, Part One, from The Return of Sherlock Holmes. I have never known my friend to be in better form, both mental and physical, than in the year ninety five. His increasing fame had brought with it an immense practice, and I should be guilty of an indiscretion if I were even to hint at the identity of some of the illustrious clients who crossed our humble threshold in Baker Street. Holmes, however, like all great artists, lived for his art's sake, and, save in the case of the Duke of Holderness, I have seldom known him claim any large reward for his inestimable services. So unworldly was he, or so capricious, that he frequently refused his help to the powerful and wealthy, where the problem made no appeal to his sympathies, while he would devote weeks of most intense application to the affairs of some humble client whose case presented those strange and dramatic qualities which appealed to his imagination and challenged his ingenuity. In this memorable year, ninety-five, a curious and incongruous succession of cases had engaged his attention, ranging from his famous investigation of the sudden death of Cardinal Tosca, an inquiry which was carried out by him at the express desire of His Holiness the Pope, down to his arrest of Wilson, the notorious canary trainer, which removed a plague spot from the east end of London. Close on the heels of these two famous cases came the tragedy of Woodman's Lee, and the very obscure circumstances which surrounded the death of Captain Peter Carey. No record of the doings of Mr. Sherlock Holmes would be complete, which did not include some account of this very unusual affair. During the first week of July, my friend had been absent so often and so long from our lodgings that I knew he had something on hand. The fact that several rough-looking men called during that time and inquired for Captain Basil made me understand that Holmes was working somewhere under one of the numerous disguises and names with which he concealed his own formidable identity. He had at least five small refuges in different parts of London in which he was able to change his personality. He said nothing of his business to me, and it was not my habit to force a confidence. The first positive sign which he gave me of the direction which his investigation was taking was an extraordinary one. He had gone out before breakfast, and I had sat down to mine when he strode into the room, his hat upon his head, and a huge barbed-headed spear tucked like an umbrella under his arm. "'Good gracious, Holmes!' I cried. "'You don't mean to say that you have been walking about London with that thing?' I drove to the butcher's and back. "'The butcher's?' and I return with an excellent appetite. There can be no question, my dear Watson, of the value of exercise before breakfast. But I am prepared to bet that you will not guess the form that my exercise has taken. I will not attempt it. He chuckled as he poured out the coffee. If you could have looked into Allardyce's back shop, you would have seen a dead pig swung from a hook in the ceiling, and a gentleman in his shirt sleeves furiously stabbing at it with this weapon. I was that energetic person, and I have satisfied myself that by no exertion of my strength can I transfix the pig with a single blow. Perhaps you would care to try. Not for worlds, but why were you doing this? Because it seemed to me to have an indirect bearing upon the mystery of Woodman's Lee. Ah, Hopkins, I got your wire last night, and I have been expecting you. Come and join us. Our visitor was an exceedingly alert man, thirty years of age, dressed in a quiet tweed suit, but retaining the erect bearing of one who was accustomed to official uniform. I recognized him at once as Stanley Hopkins, a young police inspector, for whose future Holmes had high hopes, while he in turn professed the admiration and respect of a pupil for the scientific methods of the famous amateur. Hopkins's brow was clouded, and he sat down with an air of deep dejection. "'No, thank you, sir. I breakfasted before I came round. I spent the night in town, for I came up yesterday to report.' "'And what had you to report?' "'Failure, sir. Absolute failure.' "'You have made no progress?' "'None.' "'Dear me, I must have a look at the matter.' "'I wish to heavens that you would, Mr. Holmes. It's my first big chance, and I am at my wit's end. For goodness' sake, come down and lend me a hand.' "'Well, well, it just happens that I have already read all the available evidence, including the report of the inquest with some care. 
"'By the way, what do you make of that tobacco pouch "'found on the scene of the crime? "'Is there no clue there?' "'Hopkins looked surprised. "'It was the man's own pouch, sir. "'His initials were inside it. "'And it was of seal-skin, and he was an old sealer. "'But he had no pipe.' "'No, sir, we could find no pipe. "'Indeed, he smoked very little, "'and yet he might have kept some tobacco for his friends. "'No doubt. "'I only mention it because, if I had been handling the case, "'I should have been inclined to make that the starting point of my investigation. "'However, my friend Dr. Watson knows nothing of this matter, "'and I should be none the worse for hearing the sequence of events once more. "'Just give us some short sketches of the essentials.' Stanley Hopkins drew a slip of paper from his pocket. "'I have a few dates here which will give you the career of the dead man, Captain Peter Carey. He was born in forty-five, fifty years of age. He was a most daring and successful seal and whale fisher. In 1883 he commanded the steam sealer Sea Unicorn of Dundee. He had then had several successful voyages in succession, and in the following year, 1884, he retired.' After that he travelled for some years, and finally he bought a small place called Woodman's Lee, near Forest Row in Sussex. There he has lived for six years, and there he died just a week ago today. There were some most singular points about the man. In ordinary life he was a strict Puritan, a silent, gloomy fellow. His household consisted of his wife, his daughter, aged twenty, and two female servants. These last were continually changing, for it was never a very cheery situation, and sometimes it became past all bearing. The man was an intermittent drunkard, and when he had the fit on him he was a perfect fiend. He has been known to drive his wife and daughter out of doors in the middle of the night and flog them through the park until the whole village outside the gates was aroused by their screams. He was summoned once for a savage assault upon the old vicar, who had called upon him to remonstrate with him upon his conduct. In short, Mr. Holmes, you would go far before you found a more dangerous man than Peter Carey, and I have heard that he bore the same character when he commanded his ship. He was known in the trade as Black Peter, and the name was given him not only on account of his swarthy features and the color of his huge beard, but for the humors which were the terror of all around him. I need not say that he was loathed and avoided by every one of his neighbors, and that I have not heard one single word of sorrow about his terrible end. You must have read in the account of the inquest about the man's cabin, Mr. Holmes, but perhaps your friend here has not heard of it. He had built himself a wooden outhouse, he always called it the cabin, a few hundred yards from his house, and it was here that he slept every night. It was a little single-roomed hut, sixteen feet by ten. He kept the key in his pocket, made his own bed, cleaned it himself, and allowed no other foot to cross the threshold. There are small windows on each side, which were covered by curtains and never opened. One of these windows was turned towards the high road, and when the light burned in it at night, the folk used to point it out to each other and wonder what Black Peter was doing in there. "'That's the window, Mr. Holmes, which gave us one of the few bits of positive evidence that came out at the inquest. "'You remember that a stonemason, named Slater, walking from Forest Row about one o'clock in the morning, two days before the murder, "'stopped as he passed the grounds, and looked at the square of light still shining among the trees. "'He swears that the shadow of a man's head turned sideways was clearly visible on the blind, and that this shadow was certainly not that of Peter Carey, whom he knew well. It was that of a bearded man, but the beard was short and bristled forward in a way very different from that of the captain. So he says, but he had been two hours in the public house, and it is some distance from the road to the window. Besides, this refers to the Monday, and the crime was done upon the Wednesday. On the Tuesday, Peter Carey was in one of his blackest moods, flushed with drink and as savage as a dangerous wild beast. He roamed about the house, and the women ran for it when they heard him coming. Late in the evening, he went down to his own hut. About two o'clock the following morning, his daughter, who slept with her window open, heard a most fearful yell from that direction, but it was no unusual thing for him to bawl and shout when he was in drink, so no notice was taken. On rising at seven, one of the maids noticed that the door of the hut was open, 
but so great was the terror which the man caused that it was midday before any one would venture down to see what had become of him. Peeping into the open door, they saw a sight which sent them flying, with white faces, into the village. Within an hour I was on the spot and had taken over the case. "'Well, I have fairly steady nerves, as you know, Mr. Holmes, but I give you my word that I got a shake when I put my head into that little house. It was droning like a harmonium with the flies and bluebottles, and the floor and walls were like a slaughterhouse. He had called it a cabin, and a cabin it was, sure enough, for you would have thought that you were in a ship. There was a bunk at one end, a sea-chest, maps and charts, a picture of the sea unicorn, a line of log-books on a shelf, all exactly as one would expect to find it in a captain's room. And there, in the middle of it, was the man himself, his face twisted like a lost soul in torment, and his great brindled beard stuck upward in his agony. Right through his broad breast a steel harpoon had been driven, and it had sunk deep into the wood of the wall behind him. He was pinned like a beetle on a card. Of course he was quite dead, and had been so from the instant that he had uttered that last yell of agony. I know your methods, sir, and I applied them. Before I permitted anything to be moved, I examined most carefully the ground outside, and also the floor of the room. There were no footmarks. Meaning that you saw none? I assure you, sir, that there were none. My good Hopkins, I have investigated many crimes, but I have never yet seen one which was committed by a flying creature. As long as the criminal remains upon two legs, so long must there be some indentation, some abrasion, some trifling displacement which can be detected by the scientific searcher. It is incredible that this blood-bespattered room contained no trace which could have aided us. I understand, however, from the inquest, that there were some objects which you failed to overlook. The young inspector winced at my companion's ironical comments. I was a fool not to call you in at the time, Mr. Holmes. However, that's past praying for now. Yes, there were several objects in the room which called for special attention. One was the harpoon with which the deed was committed. It had been snatched down from a rack on the wall. Two others remained there, and there was a vacant place for the third. On the stock was engraved, S.S. C. Unicorn, Dundee. This seemed to establish that the crime had been done in a moment of fury, and that the murderer had seized the first weapon which came in his way. The fact that the crime was committed at two in the morning, and yet Peter Carey was fully dressed, suggested that he had an appointment with the murderer, which is borne out by the fact that a bottle of rum and two dirty glasses stood upon the table. Yes, said Holmes, I think that both inferences are permissible. Was there any other spirit but rum in the room? Yes, there was a tantalus containing brandy and whiskey on the sea chest. It is of no importance to us, however, since the decanters were full, and it had, therefore, not been used. For all that, its presence has some significance, said Holmes. However, let us hear some more about the objects which do seem to you to bear upon the case. There was this tobacco pouch upon the table. What part of the table? It lay in the middle. It was of coarse sealskin, the straight-haired skin, with a leather thong to bind it. Inside was P.C. on the flap. There was half an ounce of strong ship's tobacco in it. Excellent. What more? Stanley Hopkins drew from his pocket a drab-covered notebook. The outside was rough and worn, the leaves discolored. On the first page were written the initials J.H.N. and the date 1883. Holmes laid it on the table and examined it in his minute way, while Hopkins and I gazed over each shoulder. On the second page were the printed letters C.P.R., and then came several sheets of numbers. Another heading was Argentine, another Costa Rica, and another San Paolo, each with pages of signs and figures after it. "'What do you make of these?' asked Holmes. "'They appear to be lists of stock exchange securities. "'I thought that J.H.N. were the initials of a broker, "'and that C.P.R. may have been his client.' "'Try Canadian Pacific Railway,' said Holmes. "'Stanley Hopkins swore between his teeth "'and struck his thigh with his clenched hand. "'What a fool I have been,' he cried. 
Of course, it is as you say. Then J, H, N are the only initials we have to solve. I have already examined the old stock exchange lists, and I can find no one in 1883, either in the house or among the outside brokers, whose initials correspond with these. Yet I feel that the clue is the most important one that I hold. You will admit, Mr. Holmes, that there is a possibility that these initials are those of the second person who was present, in other words, of the murderer. I would also urge that the introduction into the case of a document relating to large masses of valuable securities gives us for the first time some indication of a motive for the crime. Sherlock Holmes's face showed that he was thoroughly taken aback by this new development. "'I must admit both your points,' said he. "'I confess that this notebook, which did not appear at the inquest, modifies any views which I may have formed.' I had come to a theory of the crime in which I can find no place for this. Have you endeavored to trace any of the securities here mentioned? Inquiries are now being made at the offices, but I fear that the complete register of the stockholders of these South American concerns is in South America, and that some weeks must elapse before we can trace the shares. Holmes had been examining the cover of the notebook with his magnifying lens. "'Surely there is some discoloration here,' said he. "'Yes, sir, it is a blood stain. "'I told you that I picked the book off the floor.' "'Was the blood stain above or below?' "'On the side next the boards.' "'Which proves, of course, that the book was dropped "'after the crime was committed.' "'Exactly, Mr. Holmes. "'I appreciated that point, "'and I conjectured that it was dropped by the murderer "'in his hurried flight.' It lay near the door. I suppose that none of these securities have been found among the property of the dead man. No, sir. Have you any reason to suspect robbery? No, sir. Nothing seemed to have been touched. Dear me, it is certainly a very interesting case. Then there was a knife, was there not? A sheath knife, still in its sheath. It lay at the feet of the dead man. Mrs. Carey has identified it as being her husband's property. Holmes was lost in thought for some time. Well, said he, at last, I suppose I shall have to come out and have a look at it. Stanley Hopkins gave a cry of joy. Thank you, sir. That will indeed be a weight off my mind. Holmes shook his finger at the inspector. It would have been an easier task a week ago, said he but even now my visit may not be entirely fruitless. Watson, if you can spare the time, I should be very glad of your company. If you will call a four-wheeler, Hopkins, we shall be ready to start for Forest Row in a quarter of an hour. Alighting at the small wayside station, we drove for some miles through the remains of widespread woods, which were once part of that great forest which for so long held the Saxon invaders at bay. The impenetrable weald, for sixty years the bulwark of Britain. Vast sections of it have been cleared, for this is the seat of the first ironworks of the country, and the trees have been felled to smelt the ore. Now the richer fields of the north have absorbed the trade, and nothing save these ravaged groves and great scars in the earth show the work of the past. Here, in a clearing upon the green slope of a hill, stood a long, low stone house, approached by a curving drive running through the fields. Nearer the road, and surrounded on three sides by bushes, was a small outhouse, one window and the door facing in our direction. It was the scene of the murder. Stanley Hopkins led us first to the house, where he introduced us to a haggard, grey-haired woman, the widow of the murdered man, whose gaunt and deep-lined face, with the furtive look of terror in the depths of her red-rimmed eyes, told of the years of hardship and ill-usage which she had endured. With her was her daughter, a pale, fair-haired girl, whose eyes blazed defiantly at us as she told us that she was glad that her father was dead, and that she blessed the hand which had struck him down. It was a terrible household that Black Peter Carey had made for himself, and it was with a sense of relief that we found ourselves in the sunlight again, and making our way along a path which had been worn across the fields by the feet of the dead man. The outhouse was the simplest of dwellings, wooden-walled, shingle-roofed, one window beside the door and one on the farther side. Stanley Hopkins drew the key from his pocket and had stooped to the lock 
when he paused with a look of attention and surprise upon his face. "'Someone has been tampering with it,' he said. There could be no doubt of the fact. The woodwork was cut, and the scratches showed white through the paint, as if they had been that instant done. Holmes had been examining the window. "'Someone has tried to force this also. Whoever it was has failed to make his way in. He must have been a very poor burglar.' "'This is a most extraordinary thing,' said the inspector. "'I could swear that these marks were not here yesterday evening.' "'Some curious person from the village, perhaps,' I suggested. "'Very unlikely. Few of them would dare to set foot in the grounds, far less try to force their way into the cabin. What do you think of it, Mr. Holmes?' "'I think that fortune is very kind to us.' "'You mean that the person will come again?' It is very probable. He came expecting to find the door open. He tried to get in with the blade of a very small penknife. He could not manage it. What would he do? Come again next night with a more useful tool. So I should say. It will be our fault if we are not there to receive him. Meanwhile, let me see the inside of the cabin. The traces of the tragedy had been removed but the furniture within the little room still stood as it had been on the night of the crime. For two hours, with most intense concentration, Holmes examined every object in turn, but his face showed that his quest was not a successful one. Once only he paused in his patient investigation. "'Have you taken anything off this shelf, Hopkins?' "'No, I have moved nothing.' "'Something has been taken. There is less dust in this corner of the shelf than elsewhere.' It may have been a book lying on its side. It may have been a box. Well, well, I can do nothing more. Let us walk in these beautiful woods, Watson, and give a few hours to the birds and the flowers. We shall meet you here later, Hopkins, and see if we can come to closer quarters with the gentleman who has paid this visit in the night. End of Part 1 of The Adventure of Black Peter